Welcome to A Window on Samri, where we take you inside South Australia's independent not-for-profit health and medical research institute. Each episode, we get to know the people driving our life-changing research, getting into what motivates them personally and how their work is delivering a brighter, healthier future for all. Julia, where did your interest in science begin? I think as a kid, I was definitely interested in a whole range of things like doing heaps of different activities. But then at school, I think I really, I drew to STEM subjects because I enjoyed the the logic that flowed with that, you know, getting to that answer and sort of problem solving to get there. So yeah, I think it came from just a love of problem solving and trying a lots of different things and then finding that that interest in, in STEM through school. And from what age were you interested in it? I think it really came through probably about 11 or 12 sort of drawing towards those those sort of subjects at school um, and then and then following that through um, but I didn't really wasn't really in sort of a, a biology field until um, quite a lot later sort of that was only at uni so like uh, 18 19 20 sort of age so growing up you were a little problem solver yeah yeah little problem solver not a problem creator a problem solver <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else when you were when you were younger like what sort of person were you and what were you often doing? Um, I think I um, was pretty quiet, pretty quiet as a kid, happy to, you know, be out playing sport, but also happy to be inside reading a book, you know, happy with my own thoughts, thinking through that and maybe, you know, counteracting, like having a sibling, you've got your different spaces. So my sibling was probably a bit more outgoing. My sister was more outgoing and I was probably the shyer one who was, yeah, sitting back thinking about what was happening and then you know, acting or talking after, after that point. And you've both turned out to be scientists because of have. course your sister works at Samory as well. Yes. So I guess, you know, anyone can do it. And yeah, I think we've just both, we're both very similar in a number of ways. So it's perhaps not, not surprising that we've ended up, you know, in similar, similar careers. So what was the, the path that you went on to get from when you had a, an interest in science in school to where you are now? Yeah. So I think I finished school and I was lucky enough that I had heaps heaps of choices available to me um, and I wasn't really sure, but I thought that a science degree would sort of, I could continue to investigate this interest in science that I had. I mean, at that point it was mainly chemistry and, and those sorts of sciences, um, but I enjoyed being able to go into a Bachelor of Advanced Science and then sort of do, try a lot of different things again. So that's sort of common theme from my childhood, trying a lot of different things. And I picked up, that was where I started picking up biology a bit more and combining that with my chemistry knowledge and, yeah, became more aware of, you know, what was happening inside the body. I think I found that really interesting and learning about cells and what's going on inside the cells. And then that brought in a little bit of my chemistry knowledge as well. And so followed that path through science or my advanced science, doing uh, biology-based subjects and chemistry-based subjects and then sort of finalizing with a biochemistry major that where I, where I really had I'd found that interest in cancer and what was happening inside the cell you know those minute processes that are happening all the time and they're happening so quickly and your body has to do it right otherwise you end up with problems so what fascinates you about that biology i remember i watched a video at uni and we saw in real time you know what the little proteins in your cells were doing and you know you learn about it and you're like that's really cool that you know all these things are coordinated and they don't have a brain but somehow they know where to be in the cell and what to do and you're like that's cool and then we saw a video of it in real time and it was just so fast I had not comprehended how quick this would go and I just thought that was amazing that like all of these things that couldn't think for themselves but somehow knew what to do and the cell was coordinating that to happen at such a rapid pace I think that was really a moment where I was like, wow, this is really cool. I'd love to learn more about this. And, you know, cancer sort of happens when that goes wrong. And I was like, well, obviously that's going to go wrong. Look how fast that is. Like, how can that even happen right ever? So, yeah, I think it was seeing that and just like how all these processes are coordinated at such a pace was just really amazing. And your intricate knowledge of those systems, does that make you think about your own body differently? Like, do you think about these processes going on and how fast that's happening yeah. and when you eat something or do something and, and the response inside your body? Is that different because of your job? Yeah, not anymore. Maybe initially, yeah, you're kind of like, wow, what, what? Like that's going on all the time. But 
now I think, you know, you're sort of used to it and it's been my job for four years now, so I'm used to it. But you, I think you realise that people aren't thinking about that when I tell my friends about what I do and they're like, oh, my God, like, yeah. aren't you scared? Or like, how is, you know, aren't you scared of what's going on inside you? I'm like, no, it's it's really cool and like it's fun to learn about. And I guess it's just incredible to know the intricate nature of the human body and yeah. just how finely tuned everything is yeah. and must blow your mind to understand that on another level, just how detailed we are and, and fragile and how there can be these chain reactions to mm. the smallest difference. So seeing that you were really interested in these systems and amazed by how they work, how did you think you might be able to use them to achieve something positive for science and, yeah. and the human race? So did you have a concept of that? I think maybe not initially, but when you get into a lab and you have the more broad spectrum of people in that lab all doing different things and you realise that that process for scientific discovery or drug discovery that's going to have a more like patient-based impact it really has to come from the cells. Like you have to know what's going on inside the cells to know what your drug is going to do and then how it's going to affect the human body. And so with that, sort of gaining that knowledge through um, doing placements at uni and during my PhD, you know, you sort of realise that we need to know what's happening in those processes. And if you put something in from the outside, how are you going to disturb them? Because you're going to disturb them straight away. Everything's happening so quickly. There's almost no time. So, you know, we need that to then move forward. And what about the cancer side of that? Is there a personal angle to that in your life? I mean, of course, the world would be better off without cancer and there's the throwaway of we want to cure cancer uh, overall. So who wouldn't want to be part of that? But is there something more more personal to it than that? Not for me, luckily enough. Like that, I think that's really fortunate that there's been no one in my immediate family who has been been affected by that. I think what really drew me to cancer was when I had a lecture in third year from my current boss, um, Lisa Butler, and she was telling us all about how the the cells overcome everything you throw at them. So you take out what they need most importantly, and they'll just find a way to overcome that and keep going. And they can do that in a number of different ways. And I remember just going home and I was, that was probably the most scared I've been. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, we can throw something at them, but the cells will just overcome that. And I thought like, that's really cool. And I want to, you know, be able to help counteract that, you know, that resistance from those cells. So I want to know exactly what's happening when you put something in from the outside and then how can we sort of sort of reverse that? And so that's what you were thinking at the start of this and you've been at Samory for three or four years now? Yeah. Yep. So how has your the reality compared to your expectations? Because there's the, the mystery of it and the fact that it's such a difficult puzzle, yep. but does that just become really frustrating? Yes, it does, definitely, because, you know, you're like, yes, I found something that's really cool, but then you know, how do I, I need to already be thinking, how are they going to, how are the cancer cells going to overcome this? So I found something that's really cool. Let's target it. But then at the same time, you know, what are we going to do after we've figured out how to target it? And we haven't even figured that mm, out yet. So there's yet, no so. resting on your laurels. No, not at all. You've got to keep, the, the cancer is adapting, so you have to keep adapting. Um, you can't just be happy with, you know, that's it. You've got to constantly coming in from, from other angles, yeah. Do you find you're able to take the little wins along the way or because it's never ending and there's so much more work to be done, do you just brush it off? No, you definitely you have to take a moment to sit with it and be like, yep, this is cool. I found this like amazing. Yay. Um, otherwise, you know, you'd never, you sort of, you'd be keep just like a little mouse on a wheel. You'd be keep running without the payoff. So you have to, yeah, you do have to sit with those little wins, but that's kind of nice. And like everyone around you, cause they all know what you're going through and how tricky it is. They're all happy to, to sit with you. You kind of turn to your colleague and be like, oh my gosh, I found this out today. Like, and they can, they actually, you know, they understand. You've come a long way in a relatively short time. So you went through school and then your degree and then now your PhD as well. And so you've done it a lot. What else has been happening in your life? Have you been someone who's just been hyper focused or have you been able to make time for other things as well? What's that been like? Yeah. So I 
I really love my work-life balance that I've been able to have. And I think that's something that is quite unique about the PhD is that on a day-to-day level, you are somewhat your own boss. You control your time to an extent and it depends on your project. But I really liked that feeling of knowing that I was in control of what I was doing in the day and therefore, you know, if I needed to be gone at a certain time or I had to stay longer, like I could control that. And I'm really grateful for my dad because he's always really been pro uh, work-life balance. And so I've had that nice balance with things outside of um, the PhD. And then that gives you sort of a perspective and something else to think about. You don't become your PhD. You're also, you're a person as well who's living their life at the same time. So what do you do to get some space from your study and work? Yeah, uh, I love playing sport. That's really my my outlet. So most of the time it's tennis or netball or I've just started um, bouldering. Um, but yeah, I just love- Bouldering so hard. I went once <laughs> and then I was like, I'm not coming back to this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely a challenge. And even that's a problem solving challenge. You know, you, you're, at the, you're at the wall and you've got to figure out the way to get to the top and what's the best way to do it. And so, yeah, I think- that's another problem solving outlet for me. That's not just, not just my work, but yeah, I definitely love, love getting active, love getting out there. Do you like to just sit back and not do much or not solve a problem or are you, is your brain happiest when you're trying to figure something out? Yeah. I'm a bit of a, I'm a doer. I go all the time. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm happiest when I'm solving a problem. Yeah. Are you able to shut your mind off when you need to like can you can you say okay we're at work now and now we're at home and you don't have that continuous stream of thoughts because that can be really difficult for some people yeah no I'm pretty good at compartmentalizing like when I'm at work my brain is on for work and yeah when I'm at home brain is on for home have you got any tips for that or it's just natural Ah, oh, I don't know I I love planning my calendar is my best friend but I think it's just it I think it's just discipline within yourself but perhaps it just comes more naturally to me. And prostate cancer in particular, it's uh, a male cancer, one of the ones with the highest rate among men. As a female, how do you look at studying that cancer? And I suppose how has your interest and, and passion for working on that developed as you've been going? Yeah. So I think that's the fact that prostate cancer is such a huge burden in society, it really like drives me forward to sort of solve this problem because you know you could be impacting such a massive number of men and you could be impacting not only the men, but you're also, you're helping their families as well. So there's, yes, it's a, a disease that's mainly in men, but it's their families as well. So you are impacting a lot of people uh, in the community. And my passion for that has sort of grown again, like learning, you know, how prostate cancer is so smart and, you know, you just want to, you want to give the men with it a fighting chance. So, you know, the cancer is so smart. So we want to, you know, overcome that. Do you find yourself educating people about it outside of work or in your social life and just because you know so much about it now? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And you, you don't realize, I guess, yeah, you lose touch with what other people know. Like when I say some of the prostate cancer facts, like how it is, you know, one of the most prevalent cancers um, in the world, my friends are like, they just, they don't realise. And so it is nice to be able to pass that on, spread that word. And it seems like there's a a bit of a general view that, yes, prostate cancer is so prevalent, but you hear sometimes, oh, something else will kill you before prostate cancer does because it takes such a long time. Is that the truth? And do you think that's a useful way of of looking at it? It's not entirely wrong, but I think What is scary for me is that there's a lot of prostate cancers that no matter what we throw at them, they are deadly. So it doesn't matter if you treat them or you don't treat them. We currently can't can't help those men. And so I think that's what I really focus on is that there is the incurable form that is is deadly. Um, And so those are the men that, you know, you'd really you'd like to help. And what progress have you seen being made since you started really focusing on this area, I guess at SAMRI in particular, but just in the field in general? In our lab, we have heaps of people doing all sorts of different things. So we're sort of all approaching it from a different angle as like one big collective collective group. And throughout it, I've got to uh, meet men who have benefited from, you know, some of the things that we've found out. Um, and so that's been really amazing to see that you know, you're actually helping these these real people because it is easy to lose sight of that, especially with the work that I've been doing, which is so cell based. I'm I'm really far removed from the patient, so it has been really nice to see the the actual men that that you're helping. And you work 
alongside a, a pretty amazing team at St. Marie. Have you taken some inspiration from other women in STEM? Definitely. I have many women in STEM idols. So yeah, one of them is my current boss, Lisa Butler. And she was the first one that I saw in third year uni and I heard her give her talk. I was really interested in what she was talking about, but also just the way the way she was, I was like, great, I want to be like her. So that's how, why I ended up um, in her lab as well, because she's been a, an idol for me. What do you admire about Lisa and her leadership? So I really like the way she presents herself. She's always so calm and composed um, and she leads a big group. So is coordinating so many people, but she always knows what's going on with you personally. Um, and she knows what's happening with your project. And she's always there to talk if you've got, got other stresses in your life as well. Um, so I've really admired how she's able to keep that whole team going. She never seems stressed, even though I'm sure she is stressed, but at the same time, you know, has time for each person um, individually. And having had a positive experience with those mentors, how does that make you think about yourself and perhaps yourself as a leader going forward? Yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely a case of you, you, you can't be what you can't see. So being able to see those really strong and positive women in STEM, it makes me think like, yeah, I, I can do this and, and this is something that I do want to do. So yeah, it's definitely had a positive impact on my visions of my career. And do you have a, a natural inclination towards being more extroverted and being a, a, pre, a presenter in this space or is that something that makes you feel a bit nervous? Yeah. So that's something I'm definitely working on and getting Lisa's help because she is such a great presenter. And so I think, you know, I can, I can take what she knows and, and, and put that into, into what I do. Um, and so that's something that I'm definitely developing and have been developing over my career so far. Because it's so important to be able to communicate the science and communicate the message in an engaging, relatable way. And from the media perspective at Samory, see it make such a difference when all our researchers are doing such incredible work, but being able to practice and, and work on getting that information across makes a huge difference to being able to continue and extend on on your research. Yeah, definitely. And I think, again, because the work that I do is so cellular, cellular, it's quite foreign to most people. And so gaining the skills to actually turn that into something that um, everyday people can understand is really important and something that I've really worked on or tried to work on so far. And what are you proudest of in your career? I'm proudest of the fact that I've been able to manage this project. So like I said, you're, you're day to day managing yourself and you're not your own boss, but you sort of are your own boss. And so I'm really proud of the, the fact that I've been able to over four years, like just slowly keep achieving and, you know, generate this this final product. And within that, I've been able to help uh, with publications for other researchers, um, but also, you know, build my own sort of project and my own sort of ideas. So, yeah. And now that you're on the other side of having finished your PhD, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> what pearls of wisdom do you think you might be able to offer to someone else who's trying to log it out? And we know that finishing a PhD is a tremendous achievement and a really tough thing to do and, and to keep yourself motivated and moving along. What were some standout things that, that worked for you that might work for someone else? I think one of them, it sounds so simple, but when you're in the thick of it, you have to just keep going. You just have to keep turning up one day at a time and just do something and that will help you to get to the end. So, you know, just keep turning up every day, do a little bit more, and then eventually you will look back and you will see that you have actually done something. And it's been quite nice over the course of my PhD. I've had times where it's been like, okay, stop. And you actually have to put together everything that you've done. And that's a really nice way to kind of quantify what you have done. Otherwise, again, you just lose sight of what you've done over the whole, the whole course of it. So yeah, keep turning up, doing something small. And then every now and again, take a look back and you'll, you'll see how much you've done. That's good advice. <laughs> what have you found special about being at Samri? I've really enjoyed uh, all the other students that I've met at Samri. So there's heaps of students in the building and they're all going through really similar things to you. Or you've got people that are further on than you and they're still surviving. So that's nice to see. And then you've got the people that have just started and you can sort of help them out. So yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed getting involved in the student community um, at Samri being on the committee at Samri, organising those social events. That's been a highlight for me. And what about working in a team that is broad and everyone's doing their own thing? What's the magic of that? Yeah, so it, it just, you get lots of different ideas and people are thinking about 
they have different priorities because so I'm prioritizing thinking about my project and someone else is not even considering what I'm doing. They're thinking about what they're doing. But then when you come together and say like a lab meeting or something, you know, everyone is coming at it from a completely different angle. So you can get all of these different ideas. And I think that's really cool. And how much are you able to contribute even a little bit to each other's projects? Yeah. So we have um, weekly meetings where we all get together and um, someone will present present what they're working on. And it's sort of everyone's voice is able to be heard. It doesn't matter if you're the lab head or if you're the honours student or if you're the PhD student, sort of everyone's input is valued. And I really enjoy that about working in a lab. But you're leaving us to uh, head overseas for the next chapter. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I'm really excited. I'm heading over to work in the Netherlands. So staying in cancer research, but now moving to lung cancer, which is another really uh, prevalent and really deadly cancer. And I'm really excited about that opportunity. So I'm moving into a much smaller lab, which will present different challenges, but also moving into a new role as as a postdoc um, and being able to sort of help build this this new lab as a postdoc. And so I'm really excited to to go there. And what appeals to you about going overseas for f- four years at, at this time in your life? It's obviously a massive move. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always been interested in learning new things and challenging myself. I've done, I've lived overseas for a little bit during uni and I really enjoyed that challenge and I've wanted to move over there to experience a new sort of a new sort of working idea so I've I've only worked in Australia and I'd love to um, extend that out into another country and extend my connections or into another into another continent even uh, and then also the the personal challenge of living outside of Australia is really exciting to me how do you feel about going to work on a different kind of cancer to the one you've just been so focused on for so long and what's transferable between them yeah, so there are definitely things that are transferable and the lab I'm lab I'm going to is, has got a little bit in prostate cancer and so they're thinking about sort of commonalities between between those two cancers. But I think it's definitely going to be a challenge, but I'm I'm looking forward to to learning something new and I'll, you know, I won't won't forget everything that I've learned in my PhD. It'll just open me up to a whole new new range of things that I can then sort of combine those, bring them together and then move forward in my career after that. What would little Julia at school, uh, starting out as a junior scientist, think about where you are now? I think she'd be pretty amazed. I don't think she knew this is where we were going to end up. I think she'd be pretty proud that I've got this far and that I'm about to move overseas by myself and, you know, really sort of start my life, I feel like is what I'm about to do. Yeah. So I think she'd be surprised, but proud and also deep down know that, yeah, she was going to do it. She can always do it. What would you say to other little girls who think that science is pretty cool? I think keep following it. You know, if you think it's interesting, keep doing it. Don't worry about what other people are thinking. You know, if you like it, you've got to got to stick at it. And it sounds like you always had that curiosity there and that that's been enough to fuel the fire through all the work that you've had to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so I think like sometimes I even, I feel a little bit self-conscious because lots of people do have that really personal story about about why they're in it. And I'm sort of like, oh, I don't, I don't have that. Does that make me less worthy? But I don't think so. I think if, if you enjoy the challenge of it, you know, we need heaps of people coming from all different angles. That's, you know, a massive part of science. So you can do it. Keep going. And when you look back on your career, what do you want to be able to say? I want to say that I've been able to make a difference, that I've been able to find something out that then has gone through. And that's, that's potentially helping someone or helping a patient or helping their family or just make make some difference in someone's life eventually. I think that's one of the amazing opportunities in science is that you can be part of creating something that is going to last going forward and improve the whole human race. That's uh, not a bad achievement. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary when you put it like that. But yeah, I, I think I just think about it on a small level, like let's just help one person. That's right. One cell <laughs> yeah, at a time. Yeah, literally. Awesome. Well, good luck overseas and I'm sure we're going to miss you. Thanks. If you want to learn more about Samri and the researchers working to build a brighter, healthier future for you and your family, head to samri.org.au.